it is Tuesday. Today. Tuesday, Tuesday. Oh, day it is Tuesday. Uh, have you, do you ever feel like you, you've got a million hats and, and all of those hats are like monetizable, but you just don't know how? Welcome to my life. Um, uh, I want to say thank you to Betty um, from Being a Body Butter, uh, who recommended uh, us to speak to Megan. And uh, she, Megan is a CPA. Uh, she has a a wonderful consultancy that is really not. Uh, it's not one of those places that you go to. That's like that one stop shop. They have the services that they have. She really gets into talking to individuals about what makes their business run best and how to alleviate some of those startup stresses that we kind of really experience. So I, I love this episode so much because, uh, and I'm talking more today because Raquel is, is delirious and jet lagged, uh, but I loved this so much because as Bombshells is starting to grow, we're starting to ask these questions. We're like, where are we headed? What are we doing with this? This is a passion project that we didn't want to always be a passion project, but how do we take that next step? Who do we need? Who do what systems do we need? What templates do we need? What HR functions are gonna are we gonna need? You know, if this if, the, if you have thought about any of these questions yourself, this is an amazing episode for you because, a you know, a business consultancy can is such a blanket term and it can feel intimidating and it can feel ambiguous, but what we do today is really break down some of the key questions that I think a lot of freelancers, creatives, passionate hobbyists are asking, it's often really hard to find out where to begin. And so we just thought we'd solve that problem for you right now, right? And even the simple stuff, the quote unquote simple stuff like bookkeeping. How mm. do you do proper bookkeeping? Yeah. yeah. We that is not simple to me. No. Yeah, we really, so we're really grateful to have Megan here with us today and we hope you enjoy. And if you, I say it in the episode as well, um, after you've liked and subscribed <laughs> to the podcast, I'm learning how to say that more. After you've done that, then, you know, you, you get in touch with them and, and, and have a, have a half, I think they do 30 minute consults um, to just find out where you're at and, uh, and take a bit of an audit with you. And sometimes you know, I know I don't want to ask other people for help a lot of the time, but we just don't have enough time in the world to do everything. Uh, and so I hope that this really helps you to take that first step. And if you do, and if you do speak to them, let us know. We'd love to hear how it was. Uh, we really love to hear all your comments. And so many people are writing back to us right now about all the products and services that they've used after this podcast has aired. And, and that just fills our hearts up. So so enjoy uh, and, uh, and, and let us know once you've launched that business so that we can help you support it. You're listening to Bombshell Brunches, where your hosts Raquel Rudenberg and Christina Lau sip and spill with badass babes every Tuesday morning. Good morning, our wonderful babeses. I am really ready for this. I am really ready for this conversation. Uh, Raquel, I'm sure you are as well. Uh, but I want to shout out quickly to Betty uh, from Being a Body Butter, Being a Body, Being a Body, Butter, Body, um, for introducing us to Megan at Willow Oak Consulting. And Megan, in short, is a CPA living just outside of Vancouver with her husband, Evan, and children, William and Kennedy. Uh, she loves all things business related and enjoys working to make processes more efficient. This is why I am very much looking forward to having this conversation because I am not efficient at all right now in my mind. She believes that by alleviating some of the tasks by wearing one or a few of the many hats, uh, uh, one can focus their attention, time, and energy on other matters. I feel like my brain has zero matter space for itself <laughs> right now. And Raquel and I have been speaking a lot about this as we've been talking about the podcast and how things are growing and building a team and, you know, my endeavors as, you know, going more into the acting side, the, the music, launching different, different hat businesses, and obviously working in corporate social responsibility as well. These are big hats. And we're at, we're both at the stage now where the hats that we're wearing, they're not like little try them on hats. These are like 
people are people are counting on you hats. And that's where I want to really center our conversation today with someone who has built a business on making it possible for us to do what only we can do. And, uh, and so that's what I wanted to, I wanted to do by way of introduction, but thank you so much, Megan, for coming and being with us today on Zoom. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. It is such a pleasure. So I, I'm going to jump straight in and say, it, you offer small businesses help with finances, human resources, and business consulting. Uh, so you saw that need and you filled it. So, so let's talk about that for a minute. Like, tell me, tell me how you structured, uh, the transition from your, your corporate life into this. Yeah, of course. Um, so I worked in, um, the industry accounting, which is, is mainly just for a corporation in, in the finance department. So, um, I happen to love everything about my job. It was just returning back from mat leave. Um, the commute, I was commuting about an hour or two hours, um, every day to get there and back. And it just no longer really, um, felt right to me. So, um, both corporations that I had worked for in, in my experience were, I mean, they were small, they were still probably roughly, you know, 80 to a hundred people. Um, but I knew right from schooling, I knew I wanted to work with small businesses. I knew that like that hundred was probably going to be the biggest that I wanted to really work with. And so when I kind of started to dream up what I could be doing if I wasn't working there, um, I talked to a lot of, a couple of my friends had their own businesses and I, and I found myself reaching out to them and kind of, you know, just talking in general about how things were going. And, and I soon realized a lot of small businesses and entrepreneurs and creatives, they, you know, they create these businesses because they are passionate about something, whether it's a product or a service, but they don't necessarily get into providing that with the sense that they wanted to the, the business part or the finance part. Like um, I knew growing up, loving numbers isn't, is not for everybody. And knowing that you could be do, providing something that you're passionate about, but having that kind of thing in the background where you have to sit down and do your books at the end of the day, it was really daunting for some people. And it just, people just, just didn't like that part. And I, and I knew right away that that could probably be something that if I help to alleviate that part, they could really focus on doing what that they love to do. Um, and I just happen to love that part of it. So I love numbers and I love the business side of it. So it's almost like it works for both parties. I get to, you know, help them with something I love to do while they get to focus on what they love to do. And do you, when you did that, like, is there also a part where you're helping people turn their passion into a uh, more monetizable intellectual property or services or products than they could maybe consider themselves. Like if I, if I wanted to make sock puppets, cause who doesn't, uh, you know, and I was like, this is my passion and my love in my life. Um, and I said, I'm going to sell them for like, you know, $5 a sock puppet, not recognizing my own value, the labor and all of that sort of stuff. Are you, is your business consulting practice that arm of it? Does that help them to really discover what the value is of the product and, and, and actually increase that monetization ability? Um, yes, absolutely. So we have we have a different couple, I mean, I guess, sections of the business um, that would probably fall. So I kind of we do in the finance area anyways, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of segregated to the bookkeeping piece and the accounting piece. So okay. the real difference there is the bookkeeping piece is really about working with 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 companies and just getting the numbers in, making sure they're accurate, making sure they're up to date. Um, making sure those systems are in place so it's nice and easy for the client to get us the information and us to get in there so their their taxes are up to date, their GST is filed, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The accounting side of thing is kind of that step up, and that's actually saying, okay, now your books are all together and they're accurate and they're ready. Now, what do they mean? So, you know, mm -hmm. is your business doing well? Like sometimes like if you're not updating your books, you might have no idea if you're actually making a profit or not, you know, cash comes in and out, but what, at the end of the day, what is the big picture? Yeah. Um, so the accounting services, um, both it can be reoccurring or through one of the, the coaching packages is looking at the numbers more in depth. So saying, and, and one of them could be more directed towards the pricing itself. Um, there could be a wide variety of, you know, creating projections or forecasting, but one of them we do look at is pricing. So looking at the incoming money and also looking at the costs that you need to make the sock puppets. Mm -hmm. So are you even charging enough 
um, for the cost that you actually purchased to put this product together. Right. Uh, so that would, that's kind of what, like, I guess the cost of the product, um, is to make it. And mm -hmm. then also that a little additional, what's the overhead to even have the business. So some people tend to forget that there is insurance and there's, you know, dues and subscriptions of you paying for email addresses, like all that kind of stuff adds up. So you might think, okay, it costs me $2 to make the sock puppet. I'm going to sell it for five, but you're also forgetting you pay, you know, $1,500 a year for insurance. So is that yeah. kind of at the end of the day, are you still, you know, are you going to be sustainable? So yes, that's absolutely something we work with. It's in, in, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Rick. Can you talk about forecasting a little bit more? Of course. Yeah. Uh, so forecasting is something that we do. Um, I really like the tool um, because forecasting is really kind of looking at whatever period you want. It could be three months. It could be 12 months. I, I would say 12 months is probably the more accurate or the more common way to do it. Um, and it's really just looking at what the next 12 months could look like. Um, usually what we do from kind of a standard practice um, is looking at the, the, the past year, so the past 12 months, if you have it, sometimes if it's, you know, a new business, you might not have those numbers, but we usually start with kind of the historic 12 months and we, we say, okay, if everything stayed the exact same, this is what the next 12 months will look like. Mm. And then we have a discussion and we say, okay, this is what the next 12 months uh, would look like if it was exactly the same. Now, what's going to change? So mm -hmm. that's where you could say like, nope, I'm going to ramp up and I want double the income. Okay. We're going to say every month is doubled. And then we look at the expenses as well. We could say, you know, you know, that like maybe certain events are coming up. So oh, in June, we're going to pay $3,000. Let's add that in. And mm -hmm. you start to add the things more. So you start to add the things, you know, for sure are going to happen. And then you also kind of sit back and then you start adding things that might happen or that you you want to happen. So you want to do this travel, you want to travel to this, this meeting or something like that. So let's add that in. Mm. But forecasting is really a good tool too. And you can do different scenarios. So you could say, this is a best case forecast. This is what I want to do in the next 12 months. And you have it. It's really good just to visualize what could happen and how to get there. Mm. The other good thing about it is it's not a set in the stone. It's, you know, it's an Excel sheet. You can change it at any time. So what I usually recommend is once a month or once a quarter, really, if you would go in there and you actually start to populate it with what actually happened. So say we did it now for the next 12 months. In three months time, we can go in there and actually put what happened from June to August. And then that really gives you a visual of what you thought would happen compared to what actually happened. And then you can go change the future and say like, okay, like maybe I didn't make quite as much and that wasn't realistic. So let's bring that back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or you could have made actually more money and you can be like, okay, let's increase my goals. So yeah. it's just a very moving document, but I think it's a wonderful visual um, that people can take with them and, and, and change around at any time. It's also like a financial vision board almost, right? Yes. You're Absolutely. like, you know what, this is, yeah. what, and, and this is a, a big thing. You know, we have so much, so many of our audience are entrepreneurs in various ways. They're starting out, they're freelancers. They're not even considering themselves necessarily businesses that have other people involved, but these constructs are still the same. And I think it's really hard. I know for me starting out and freelancing and consulting, there are so many different elements that I don't know when to build the elements of my team. So at what point do, would you turn around and say, okay, you're, a, you're a, an entrepreneur that has X amount of money coming in. At this point, you need to be thinking about what these, like forecasting. At this point, you need to be just focusing on the bookkeeping. Uh, that'll do for you right now. Uh, what are these kind of tipping points. Can you paint us that picture of like from, because I, I'm thinking about an audience member that is like, I'm, I'm a songwriter. I just landed my first publishing deal. Um, I've got, you know, $20,000 worth of income coming in plus a part-time job. Um, and that 20,000 is kind of neither here or there. I don't know if I should incorporate yet. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know if I should like spend my money on marketing or spend my money on setting up the finance first. Help, help me paint a picture in that scenario. And then maybe we'll take it to a different kind of situation where someone's got one or two employees. Of course. Yeah. Um, and I think, so I think there's, there's some instances where certain things could work 
I think a lot of like, like, for example, like a forecast, you know, that could very well be beneficial before you start or as you start to get an idea of what the next year is going to look like. Mm-hmm. With that said, you know, being someone that did start a company like not too long ago, it's probably one of the last things are on your mind, especially if you're starting out fairly small. Mm-hmm. For a service-based business, especially, there's not usually a ton of expenses off the bat. So I think you would be safe if you wanted to go towards more like just making sure systems were in place, um, like your bookkeeping was in place before you got to that next step of like, I want to forecast my next 12 months. Mm-hmm. So I think for me, if you're just starting out and you're kind of in that, you know, even you might have a little bit of a part-time job, you're just kind of, you know, almost starting a little bit as a hobby, kind of getting your feet wet in there. Mm-hmm. You know, I think some of the, the the important things to start with is is bookkeeping. So whether you want to get a bookkeeper, you don't necessarily have to pay for someone right away, but get some knowledge around it. There's a lot of great courses out there. Um, you could get a business coach just to kind of walk you through the setup. Or there's a lot of like even QuickBooks has, you know, free online training. So even trying to just get that basic bookkeeping around just to make sure that you have your books up to date right from the beginning because I have done a lot of stuff where you know you kind of go back a year you know you're in business for a year and then you realize you haven't been keeping any of it and then it just becomes an extremely daunting task and it almost scares you from bookkeeping for the year after yes you've now had to reconcile 12 months so I think setting up the processes (laughs) when it comes to like bookkeeping and stuff like that is probably an important one Uh, I mean you don't need to take an actual accounting course but there are a lot of videos out there that can kind of get you going um, when it comes to marketing and stuff, I mean, I think that also is very dependent on your, on your business. So mm-hmm. if that's the way you're going to be getting clients and that's going to be the way that you are like growing your company, then I think, you know, if, if marketing isn't something that you're necessarily an expert at, then I think that could be a beneficial thing to start with as well. Um, again, it's it kind of depending on, on the cost as well. If you're just starting out, if you have a part-time job, you also might be able to have a little bit extra funds to pay for that stuff. If yeah. you're just starting out and you don't have that income, then you might want to, you know, look at, you know, just doing some social media yourself until you have that enough money to kind of do that expense. And how does Willow Oak kind of, do you take, uh, have a, a consult phone call to see where a business is at and whether you're going to be a fit first? Like how does, how do people reach you and find you and, and deal with, with you? Yeah, of course. So yeah, we do do um, consult calls. So we usually do a 30 minute consult call for, for any package really. Um, and mm-hmm. we just try to get to know each other. I, I usually like to them, the client to start of just kind of tell me what support they're looking for mm-hmm. um, to determine if even that's something that we would, we could provide the most value for. So, you know, there's always something that, you know, it might be, it might turn out not being quite up or out. Like maybe we can actually provide what we, what they need and mm-hmm. we'd be happy to recommend them to maybe a tax accountant or someone that we know that's more of an expert in, in the field that they need. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely talk. I think it's it's definitely more of a conversational piece and it's really just getting to know each other and making sure that, you know, we're a good fit. Um, mm-hmm. Like, and it's going to be a good relationship and, and we can provide what they need. So um, yeah, we definitely do that. And what about your HR services? What do you, what do you do with that? Yeah. So um, I was actually really lucky to, um, when I, when I started with my, the second corporation that I was working at for the industry, um, I was actually the 10th employee. It was a brand new company. I had known the CEO, CEO from a previous company. Um, but with that, because everyone else, the nine other employees were all engineers. So I, I was the first kind of person in the business side of things. And I was really grateful that I got that experience because, because it was so small, like, um, they could only have one role to do finance, HR, and then men. Mm-hmm. And they really gave me the opportunity to be a part of that business and the growth. So even though my schooling and all that kind of stuff is, is mainly more towards the finance area, um, I got a lot of good experience in HR and operations. So when I first founded Willow Oak, um, I included that. Um, I continue doing some HR work, more on the administrative side when it comes to Um, onboarding, um, I do payroll, um, pieces like that, HRIS systems, implementation and stuff like that. Um, So I sit more with like that kind of pieces. With that said, um, my best friend um, and sister-in-law, we have a long history story. She um, is actually coming, she's actually on board already part-time and she's coming on board. um, She has been schooling in the last 10 years in full HR. So she is going to be um, introducing some real robust HR services in the coming months. Um, and that's going to be everywhere from coaching, um, leadership trainings, 
um, um, what else is there? Like about, like she does programs and mentorship um, and pretty much everything HR shall be. Anything from hiring an employee all the way to terminating an employee. Amazing. And when you talk about, uh, you were talking about implementation um, and things like that. Can you walk people through what that looks like? Like, what does that actually mean um, for someone who is hiring their first employee? How, what does that actually look like? Because I think a lot of people might think that it's simpler than it can be (laughs) (laughs) when you just bring someone on and you move forward. So can you really like dig into the details of what that looks like and why they might need to go a little bit further than they realize. Of course. Yes. Uh, And definitely. I think that, you know, hiring your first employee can seem very like you meet somebody and you you hire them on. Um, And in a lot of cases, I mean, it can be a fairly easy process, but there are a few background things that you do want to make sure that you've number one considered and also number two, you have in place for your new employee. So the first one, um, is just making sure you understand the costs behind it as well. So having an employee, um, you are um, responsible for paying, um, number one, paying them regularly. So based on a pay period, um, you are also um, will be required to pay into their CPP and their EI. So that is part of the payroll deductions um, and remitting that to the CRA. And then other little things like um, you're going to have to uh, register for WCB. Um, and What does that mean? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. WCB is work safe in British Columbia. Okay. So companies, once you, once you start to have employees, you are required to register for work safe. And that basically means if anyone gets hurt on the job, um, then you are covered by insurance. Right. Um, the premiums are quite low, especially if you're like a service-based business. If you're in the trades, it might be a little bit higher, um, but it is a percentage of the wages that you pay per year you do have to pay for. Um, and then also just like dues and subscriptions. So, you know, just re- remembering you have to pay, you got to get an extra email, you got to get an extra, you know, QuickBooks login or Dubsado CRM login or something. So there's a lot of little costs that some people don't necessarily recognize that have to be added. Um, and then the other one is just having the documentation in place. So sometimes people think like, oh, okay, I'll just, you know, start working and I'll get your offer letter later. You know, there are, there's actually more that goes into an offer letter. Number one, you want it to be legally binding. Um, and there also is um, requirements to actually have them signed prior to them starting. So there is some small, you know, fine print that if they if they sign after the fact, then, you know, there is some stuff behind that that you're actually supposed to do if they are signing an agreement after they've already started. So little things like that, it's probably low risk. I mean, it's something to worth talking to a lawyer about, but documentation is a big one. So employment agreements, um, uh, and policies. So there are some requirements um, with the Employee Standards Act that you are required to have certain policies in place. Um, I know one of them is a bullying and harassment. Um, there's just ones that you, even though you don't think would ever happen, like sometimes people are virtual and like you don't actually ever really see people. Um, there are some policies that are actually a requirement to have. So just making sure that you are compliant with those as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that's all kind of stuff to do prior to hiring someone. So making sure you have it in place. So when they, when they come on board, it's impressive to them that you're like, okay, here it is. Here's your agreement. Here's the policies. You got to read, you got to sign. And it's like a nice smooth transition for them as well. And I think that that, that kind of creates a good relationship right from the start. And what about people who are, uh, you know, not hiring employees, but they're enlisting contractors? Yes. What does that um, yeah. look like? So um, in Canada, anyways, the CRA has um, rules actually to determine if someone is a contractor versus an employee. So um, I have heard in the past where people think that it's an option. Um, it is not. It is. A, it does have to align with what the CRA believes the relationship is. Mm-hmm. Um, there are five rules, I think, in, in general. Um, so number one is making sure that you do have the correct relationship in place. Um, I think off the top of my head, I think the three main ones that I talk to clients on, which I think is the most popular for like small businesses is number one, like the hours that they work. So like if you're asking someone to come in nine to five or be online from nine to five and like you're kind of the one driving when they need to work, then that could potentially that's more likely an employee relationship because you're kind of dictating when 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 they need to do stuff. A contractor relationship is more like okay, I need this project done. It's due by, you know, June 15th, get it done when you can, you know, they have a little bit more Mm. flexibility They're They likely have another job, you know, they can kind of do it when, when, when they need to. 
Um, so that's one of them. Um, and then the other one is, uh, is the income. So like, are you the sole person that are, are paying them? Are they living off like the income that they're getting from you? Um, or some people, like they go to school, they have another job, you know, like that would could likely be more of a contractor role when they have multiple jobs. Maybe they have their own business and they're just billing you through them. That's a contractor role. But if you're their sole income provider, um, then that could also lean towards the employment side. So number one is determining if the role is is a contractor or an employee as per the CRA requirements. Um, and then the, the onboarding, I guess, it, it's slightly different. At the end of the day, you don't have to have them on payroll. You don't have to have them. You're not paying into their CPV or EI. You're actually just paying off the invoice that they provide you. So they should be mm. invoicing you from their company or from their name, and then you pay it as if you're paying any other bill. And they're responsible for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then so, they're responsible for their taxes on their side. Selfish question. So my my dream in the next two years is to have as close to a PA as I can, a personal assistant of some kind. Mm -hmm. And I and a lot of people have said to me, like, you should get a virtual personal assistant, or you know, yeah. find find a way to get a get a personal assistant. And I was like. Okay, but then how does that look? Is that that's an employee position? That's a contract position? Is that a vague area? Like what is yeah, that? Yeah, it's probably a vague area. I mean, like I like I've had a virtual assistant before. Um, mm -hmm. there's like there's virtual assistants out there, more towards the business side of things. Mm -hmm. um, but that was actually hiring their company to do work for me, and they had multiple clients. They had mm -hmm. you know, they were doing multiple things. They had their own income. That's a contractor role because you're actually kind of hiring their services. Right. If you okay. Have someone that's like with you, say like. Like, and, and if it's personal, like if they have, like, I know people that hire nannies and they're actually in their house, you know, nine to yes. five, the, yeah. you know, you're their sole full-time employment. That would be an employment relationship. Right. Um, yes. So I think the differences would be number one, do they have their own company? Mm -hmm. Do they work for more people, more than one mm -hmm. person? Mm -hmm. Um, are you kind of dictating their role? So it's like, are you with me, you know, nine to five every day? Or is it more like, here's my list. Can you get it right. done by Friday kind of thing? So I How think that's the differences. Tell me how the virtual assistant was for you. I'm so Amazing. curious. <laughs> really? <laughs> what, were the, what are the kind of things that you hire a virtual assistant to do? So I, I remember getting it. I think there was just a lot that I was doing and it was more the, like, it was the administrative stuff. It was the getting the contracts out. It was, um, I, I have these little templates that I started using with my review, like reviewing my clients where, you know, I, I, like I talked to them about their sales and their expenses and like, I wanted them, I wanted them nice looking. I wanted them branded and I just could not find the time to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And I hired, um, AK virtual assistant They're they're a Vancouver company. And oh my goodness, like things that I thought, like if I did, it probably would take me two hours. I think also just getting my mind into it. I had other things on my mind. I was trying to fit it in. Yeah. And I remember seeing their timesheets and they did it in like 10 minutes. Like it was, and cause it's just, it's what they do. Oh. It's what they focus on. Yeah. And, what they could do in the amount of time was unbelievable. And I was just like, this is amazing. <laughs> like, wow, so I 100% recommend them. And I and I'm sure there's tons of virtual assistants out there. Um, and yeah, I think it, it's just so nice to have. I think one of the things I learned in entrepreneurship is, you know, we're not going to have time to do it all. And we're, we're not also experts. <laughs> you know, I'm not an expert at branding in branding pages and that kind of stuff. It would take me forever trying to get the pictures right. And, you know, it's yeah. just not where I want to draw my attention. So finding that those areas that I needed support in and, and, and getting someone that was a, an expert in it um, and finding that it was definitely worth it. Was so valuable. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I just I want for our audience to be starting to assemble their dream team, right? And yeah. to be starting to assemble what that looks like to build a business because it's so intimidating to kind of like Raquel and I started Bombshell Branches. We were like, we don't know what this is going to be, but this is going to be big. We don't know how we're yeah. going to, how it's going to happen. And I was very much like, no, it's not, I can't deal with big. I can't do it. And Raquel was like, <laughs> we're going to go by the stars. <laughs> and I, and like, she's off and I'm just like trying desperately to figure out how to like keep up. Yeah. Um, but th that's a really big thing with, with more and more women, um, you know, people who have not been in situations, uh, they find, we all find ourselves in new situations post pandemic. People are looking at multiple revenue streams. People are recognizing that the safety of an quote unquote job is not real. And so I think people are starting to diversify that income, but doing a bad, I, I'm just saying not all people, I'm doing a terrible job of it. 
I'm doing a terrible job of being like, I've got these great resources. I've got these great like people around me. I have these great ideas. I cannot, I am not running my business as well. Like I, I just know that I'm not. And so I guess I was so excited to talk to you because I think that so many people I have heard in the creative industries, whether they are in a full-time job and they're starting to explore freelance graphic design or freelance um, music composition for odd jobs here and there, you know, it, it's so valuable to set yourself up. My friend Mike says for the next 10 years, you know, you set yourself up your business systems for the next 10 years. What does that investment look like? So if they came to you and said, okay, well, I know it's different for different people, but let's say, for example, it's someone in a situation where they're like, okay, what do you think it'll take for me to feel set up? Uh, what does that finance piece look like? Like, is it, is it a $5,000 investment for a small business who's, you know, just starting out, who knows what their product is? Is it, are we looking at a retainer based thing? Are there all these options? you know, what, what's available to people? Cause I just, I look at it and I'm like, I don't even know where to start. Do I start by hiring a virtual assistant? Do I start by getting, I have an accountant who does all my, um, all my books for me. What do I do? Where do I move my money and where do I place it? That's just such a big question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that was not an easy question to answer. No, no. Yeah. And I, and I definitely, definitely get what you mean. And I think, especially when you're starting out, I think everyone's a little bit, you know, on air on the side of caution, like we don't, yeah. we don't necessarily know how much money we're going to make. Like, I mean, I went into like building Willow Oak thinking like, you know, it's going to take me years before I get, you know, the same amount of money as I got corporate. Like I had no idea. Um, and I think when you, when you don't have quite the idea yet, you're like, I can't spend any money. Right. Because yeah. You don't know. Yeah. And, like you might be pleasantly surprised that it happens a lot quicker or in some instances, it depends on the market. It might actually take you a little bit longer, which is totally fine as well and very common. So mm -hmm. I think I think a couple of things that you want to think about, about like where to invest your money is thinking about things that, number one, you just you either don't have the expertise to do yourself or you just do not have the time to do it. So if there's something that's very important in your business and you're like, I want nothing to do with that. And I just, I wouldn't even be good at it kind of thing. Yeah. Then that's where you should focus. I don't think there's really any one or the other. I think depending if you're going to incorporate or not an incorporation, you should more than likely definitely have an accountant at some point because they, mm -hmm. they would be doing your, your ta uh, corporate tax the first year. So having someone like that to talk a little bit more about taxes is a good investment. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just kind of trying to like, and I think starting slow. So like you don't need an accountant and a marketing and a virtual assistant and all of them right off the get go. I think you kind of dial in and say what needs to be done, but I do not or cannot do myself. And if that's the bookkeeping piece or the accounting piece, go for mm -hmm. that. If that's mm -hmm. the, all the little things like creating little templates or creating all the contracts, you know, maybe get a virtual assistant for the first, you know, first year and see how that goes. So I know it doesn't really answer the question, but I think number one, start slow. Don't, don't hire five people right off the bat, but mm -hmm. uh, I think you'd be surprised at how much you can do on your own to, to, to get going, but just mm -hmm. making sure that you do have that support. Um, especially if you do have another job, like if you have, you know, if you're working on the side of things, like there's no yeah. way you're going to do it all yourself and, and we shouldn't have to do it ourselves because there's so many experts out there that we can all work together to kind of make, to make our dreams happen. Yeah. Tell me about incorporating. When do you need to do that? When is that important? So, um, I mean, some people like there is, you know, I think that the main difference is you have to look at that. I usually tell people, um, is yes, the, the tax rate is lower. So the tax rate of an incorporation is lower than having employment or self-employment tax. Um, I don't usually recommend based on the number of your sales. What I usually say is, are you, it's only the tax rate scenario is really only beneficial if you're at the stage where you're keeping money in the business. So a lot of people are like, Hey, I make, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year. Should I incorporate? And then I say, how much money do you take out of the business? If they take out all of it for their bills and their personal stuff, at the end of the day, they're still getting billed at the employment rate or the self-employment rate. Cause they're taking the money out. Like they're paying mm. themselves that money, which now becomes employment income. 
So it kind of gets to that point where it doesn't necessarily matter how much you make. It's more, are you keeping money inside the business to benefit mm -hmm. from that lower tax rate? So that's one of them. Mm. Uh, the other one is liability. So when you're a sole proprietor or a partnership, you are your business. So you, you and your business are one person. It's you, you record it on your personal taxes. That also means that if anything ever were to happen legally with your company, you are your company. So that would be, you would be more liable for any kind of lawsuits that came your way. And they when can come after anything you own too, as a person. Yes. So if you own yes. property, yes. if you have, assets, all yeah. that kind of stuff yeah. is on the hook. I mean, if you had a really, really low key, like low risk company, it might not be something you're, you're, you're worried about, but mm -hmm. the higher the risk, you know, the more you might want to consider incorporating. Mm -hmm. Incorporation means that you're basically taking your company and you're creating a new entity. So now you guys are completely separate. You guys are not mm -hmm. together. It's two completely separate tax returns. Um, you can still get paid by it, but you're, you guys are separate. So it is more of a limited liability, which if, if your company were ever to get into a lawsuit, they, I like to say they can't come after you. Obviously there's some fine print, obviously very unique situations where they might be able to, but that would be something you want to speak to a lawyer about. But mm -hmm. for the most part, it is much more, you are much more protected when you are incorporated. So um, that is the second kind of difference. So um, the tax rate, um, the liability, and then the other one I just like to remind people is the cost. So it does cost, you know, usually I would say on average, probably about, Twelve to fifteen hundred dollars to incorporate if you're going through a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, it could be about four hundred, four hundred to five hundred dollars for them, the lawyer to continue doing some annual filings. I recommend that just because you don't forget about it. Um, but then your taxes can also, I mean, for a very basic kind of company, um, your taxes every year could also cost about twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a year. So you're looking at quite a bit more costs related to it. So just something to consider when when you're deciding. But I mean, a, a, an accountant would co potentially cost you, like, I mean, you're talking about, okay, $2,000 per year for incorporate, like for an annual, around an annual fee when yeah. it's with your lawyer and, and the accountant, um, and a, and a $1,500 one-off fee, right? But yeah. if that means, so, I mean, I, like my accountant costs a thousand dollars a year anyway for my, for, as a self-employed person. I have, um, like, do they do like all your bookkeeping and everything? I do it. Okay. <laughs> I do. I do a well, lot of I the mean, spreadsheet, it, but it, I have a, to... I have a complicated yeah. situation. Like I have, I right. have, I own property, right. And, and have international, um, tax. So it's, it's not an easy, it's not a straightforward thing. And plus there's like little bits of revenue coming in in different places, but that's why I think it's really important when you are starting to build, like, uh, we, you know, we, we look at this era of influencers and people who are, you know, self, they're, they're public figures, you know, podcast hosts, for example, you know, once things start get monetized, start getting to be monetized, like, does that, is it actually better to be incorporated because you are, um, you're, you're in a creative industry and you need to limit your liability potentially, um, but also that you need to, you, you know, a lot of those expenses are valid in that, in that business and should be used and should be kind of flowing in a more structured way than if you're just self-employed and it's kind of this nebulous thing. That was, yeah. I meandered around that, that statement, but we got there and this is how much I am not a numbers person. <laughs> Whenever people, people talk about finances and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just like, I just drift away. I just like creep off. <laughs> no. And that's, I think that's absolutely it. I think it is also, it, it's just a little way also just to be that separate. And I think it kind of gives you kind of that separation a little bit where, I mean, you can still be like a sole proprietor and still have separate bank accounts if you really wanted to, but there is still that always a little bit of like mingling, you know, like cause yeah. you are your business. There is like everything the company makes, like the profit is your income because there's no, that is just, you are your business where when yeah. you're incorporated, it just, it does nicely kind of separate things a little bit and everything just kind of runs through the company. Now you stop mingling your personal stuff and you know, your mm. company, the company, the corporation could you know, they could make $200,000 a year, but you're, you're only paying yourself, you know, maybe 60,000 a year. So, you know, you yeah. have a little bit more flexibility. There's a little bit more opportunity for tax planning when it comes, when you are separated that way. Mm. Uh, but I agree. I think it is also just like a nice cleaner way to do it. If it, if it, if it makes sense for your company.
And I think if you're intending to be in that situation, I think there's also something about setting that intention. And obviously you want to do that at a time where that that extra $3,000 or the 1500 plus the 1500 annual is justifiable. You want to be close to that, but you also want to be looking at, okay, is this going to need to happen? How do I set myself up and structure so that I can live a life where I'm giving myself that space to, to run this business and run these companies, right? Or yes, company. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you're looking into the future as well, sometimes it's, it's nicer to get things done and, and started, even if you're not quite there, but you know, like the goal is to be there next year or the year mm-hmm. after that. And I think that kind of comes down to a different things. I always recommend getting, you know, people talk about accounting software. It's a little bit off topic, but I, I always recommend going for something that's going to grow with you rather than going for something that might work now. But if your yeah. goals are really large next year, having to do that transfer, that change, things are just going to be a little bit more complicated when you're 10 times more busier because you've reached your goal. So right. if you're planning to be at that stage of kind of incorporation next year and you know, you're know you pretty set on the fact that it's going to happen, then why not do it this year? And then just have everything nice and organized and ready to go for when, when all your goals and stuff come true. Mm. So... People can hire you and then you will help them out with bookkeeping, accounting, financial planning, HR. Um, But you also have an eight week program and you created that, I believe, off the top three pain points that you recognized in your clients. And that includes money mindset, bookkeeping and systems and understanding the numbers. Can you talk a little bit about money mindset? Of course. So I think one of the things that I, I've noticed, especially in the first year and, and and getting clients and kind of, you know, starting to meet with them was the fear that was around money. And mm. it was it was just so interesting to me. And I, I think there's kind of two parts of it. And one is people don't necessarily understand what's happening in the background. They don't understand how bookkeeping works or what to do. And they also, once that's done, they don't know what those numbers mean. And I think Sometimes when that knowledge isn't quite there, it's it's scary because you don't know if it's being done right. Or people mm-hmm. always worry, like, if I'm not doing right, you know, am I going to jail? Like, the CRA is always like, you know, you can't do things wrong. Like, at the end of the day, like, you know, tiny, yeah. So anyways, I always saw, like, you know, that fear in people that they weren't doing things right or things weren't getting done or they were mm-hmm. missing something. And then the other side of it was also, like, there was just, just people just don't like to talk about money anymore. And it's like... <laughs> Um, anytime we start a consult or we start a conversation, it's like, you could tell people just blocked off right away. And I always thought that was so interesting. And I didn't even realize it myself until I really got to like talking to people that, you know, I like even conversations with my family or friends, like money was just never talked about. And it was almost to that instance of why, like, why did over the last 10, 20 years, all of a sudden money become this thing where if someone told you how much they made, you were like, Oh, like, why would you tell me that? You know, like, and like, I don't know why that ever became a thing because it shouldn't be like, it should, mm. money should be talked about money is something that you can, you can talk like it's, it, it shouldn't be this horrible conversation. Or I think what happened is somewhere down the line, it also became competitive and people mm. would say like, Oh, she told me how much she made and I don't make that much where it's like, why is it competitive? Like it shouldn't be like you. I, and I think there's some belief around for me, like if you want, you can make as much money as you want to make. You just have to, you have to go get it kind of thing. And I think there's this, so the money mindset piece is there's two parts. One of it is number one, understanding the numbers to the point where it's not scary anymore. So I think that if people know how to enter their invoices and enter their expenses, and they know that they can't really go wrong from there, then a lot of the fear kind of comes away. Mm. And knowing where to find certain numbers to even, and again, it's not an accounting course. It's more just like as a small business, what do you need to go look at? And once they can go find that, they're like, Oh, that makes so much sense. And I think just taking, giving them that lit, that knowledge takes that fear away from it. And I also think that will then bring up the fact that people, you know, we can have conversations around money. You don't have to tell people how much you make if you don't want to, but I think the conversation around money just doesn't have to be this competitive thing anymore it can be this money is a tool that we get for providing something. And it was created way back in the day. People used to trade sheep for wheat. And that's just because that's, they didn't have something called money. And over time they created it, this, this currency to make that easier, just to make it an easier trade. 
Um, so it, it was just meant to, you know, be a tool that people used to kind of get something they need or give something to someone else that they need. But I think that it came around to being this competitive thing that just, it doesn't need to be competitive. You can, you can be happy with how much ever you make. And some people want to make a lot of money. Some people don't want to make a lot of money. And that is a hundred percent up to you. I think we've got to work. I, I think I've got to work my way through my fear of numbers. Just hearing you say that, and like just that release of 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 the of my cortisol levels when it's like, okay, I need to like acknowledge that money is a tool rather than it this intimidating like dementor that sucks the <laughs> life out of my existence when I think about it or think about going yeah. after it, right? Because you know, acknowledging that it's a construct. And it's so difficult with nebulous, with nebulous careers or careers that are not really definable, where the value of me being on stage is, is, you know, X amount per day. And it's, I'm doing not the same thing as Beyonce, but we're doing the same profession and getting very different amounts of money. And so when, when you're in this creative field in any capacity, if you're the top graphic designer in your field, you're, you're putting a price point on it. That in itself to me carries a lot of shame of like, this is how much I charge a day. This is what I'm worth. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that ties into actually that money mindset as well, that piece of just deconstructing, recognizing that it's a tool and then really being able to then take a big breath and objectively look at how you are going to generate that in order to continue to, pr- to provide services. And I'm going to be fully transparent with our audience. We always are like bombshell brunches. We want to be able to do that. We want to be able to continue doing this. And I said to uh, my friend the other day, when we were in the studio, we're working on an album together. And I said, I just want enough money to be able to make sure that you don't go do something else and we get to stay in the studio. And I, that means I need to generate enough money to be in the studio. And it's the same with the podcast. I don't want this podcast to make a ton of money just because I love the idea of having a ton of money, which I very much do. There's a vintage store on Main Street that I'm just obsessed with right now. And there are so many items of clothing that I would love to have in my life. But the point is, I want in the first instance to make as much as possible for this to get as far as possible. And that means that I need to be affording to spend the time that it takes on this. It's not sustainable otherwise. And that's the thing that, you know, I think coming back to building that great team and having a good mindset surrounding that money is so, so important. And maybe that's something I need to just take a step back with. And Raquel in my next meeting needs to be like, okay, what's our, what's our mindset when it comes to this? So that was number one, was it out of three? Yeah. The money mindset. And then it's the bookkeeping and systems. Yeah. And just to touch on the, on the mindset thing you were just mentioning, I think that is one of the really good. Like, I think that's a really strong point that you're actually already thinking about is for people. And I, and I forget the exact saying or the quote that I've seen before, but it's, it's not necessarily thinking necessarily about the dollar value that you want. It's more about where you want to go with it. So I want this. Yeah, I love that. You can think of number one, what you want the company to do. So I want, you know, for us, we want to get to a, a good foundation that we can spend that we're making enough, number one, of course, you want to make enough to have the lifestyle you want. And I think that's creating your vision, not thinking about like, oh, I used to always be stuck growing up saying like, oh, I want to make $150,000 at my career, like thinking desk job when I was younger. And yeah, that I always stuck on this figure. And then I realized that it's not about the figure. It's about what I envision. I want my life to look like next year in five years and in 10 years. And if I envision it like that, like if I'm like, we want a summer home in 10 years, it's not a dollar mm. figure. It's that's what I want in my life. Now, how do I go get that? It's not like I need to make right. 100,000 or 200,000 to get there. It's what do I see I want my life to look like? And then how do I go and get that? And I think it's so right. it's number one, of course, you want to make money to, to fit your lifestyle. And then secondly, where do you want the business to go? So exactly like you said, you want to make enough money for this to reach as many people as possible. And I think that's, you want to see the vision of the company. For us, we want to make enough money where we can have a stronger charitable initiative. So, but we have to make enough money to kind of be able to focus on that. So I think focusing more on the vision or where you want to take both the business and your life, it's Mm. something more to focus on than the dollar amount. Because at the end of the day, everyone, like there's a value on everything. And guess what? People just, Beyonce just decided one day that her concerts are going to cost $400 
a ticket. That was just like a choice that was made and people paid it. So there was mm-hmm. like not necessarily much of a calculation. It was like, I think this is worth $400 a ticket. That's what it's going to be. And people paid for it. So mm-hmm. And I think that um, just on that then, Raquel, just a note for later, that there's a, I, I would like, um, there's a specific Christian Dior tracksuit that is at <laughs> Bourjou's Angels on Main Street. Um, and I would like for our business in future to be able to afford me to go <laughs> in and get that and get that tracksuit because I want it so much in, my life. You in that tracksuit <laughs> it is so perfect um and uh, uh yes okay so right I'm just all of a sudden I'm thinking of all of these fabulous outfits <laughs> straight away uh but yeah that's great I love that state the statement of like you know where you want your life and your business to be because the, then the, the the details can kind of they can arrive uh, but if you don't know those two things, and Raquel and I have spoken about this extensively, if you don't know those two things, it makes it quite difficult. And I get very trapped in the in that hundred thousand dollar, or oh, because then I can. And it's a very zero sum mentality. I think it's sometimes it's just much more scarcity based than it is. Here's the vision. Whereas Raquel is like, pew, it's just it's so like we're Tony, we're the new Tony Robbins, and I'm like, oh god, like uh, it's, But it's also very values based. So I think what you're saying, yeah. especially when you're thinking about where you want to take the business, when you start thinking about like hiring practices and you want to bring more people onto your team, if you're just going for a dollar amount, it's you're going to have a very tough time trying to align yourself with the people that you're bringing on your team um, and articulating that. Whereas if you have a vision of where you want the company to go and you talk to employees or potential people who are going to work with you about that vision, and if that vision aligns with things that they care about, now you have a team that's all driving towards the same thing and you can put a dollar amount that is helpful. You don't want to have no dollar amount because Mm. you need a goal. You need to know, okay, in order to make this vision happen, we're going to need to make X amount in the next two years. And then I can get you an employee and you can start managing them and then you can build your goals. And so all of those career or, or company goals and then interpersonal goals are so important to drive the company forward. Um, and it really is that that beautiful marriage of like the vision of where you want it to go is just as important as the amount of money that you need to make it happen and vice versa. Um, but you're right. When you just think about the dollar amount, we all have kind of skewed ideas of how much is a lot, how much isn't. Um, where does that money go? What if you advice, don't have, yeah. yeah, like, are you going to buy the tracksuit or are you just going to spend it on something else? Because you kind of forgot about why you wanted that money in the first place. Right. Yeah, so, um, I do think that that's so important to have that money mindset. I love that. I love that you have coaching on that. Mm-hmm. So that's money mindset. Then there's bookkeeping and systems and systems. Yeah. Which so, Christina yeah. loves. <laughs> so yeah, that piece is really just making sure that we go through everything bookkeeping. So making sure that, you know, like the all the ins and outs, everything you have to do, what you have to focus on on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, you know, mm-hmm. what, what things mean, what is bookkeeping. And the systems piece kind of comes out of that. So how to best set up the systems that it's going to make it the easiest for you. We know this is a daunting task for people. So this coaching program is really to give people the confidence to do this kind of stuff on their own. So they're not quite ready to hire someone that's, that, that's going to do it for them. Or they also are just interested in doing it on themselves. A lot of people like to do it themselves because they really get to see the ins and outs of their business. So this one is really just, it's bookkeeping 101. We go through definitions. We go through, we walk through the accounting software. So I always highly recommend accounting software, which whatever one you choose but it does so much for you that you get out of it. And it helps like the transaction piece. It just makes it a lot easier for you. So we walk through the system, we get it set up. You know, we work through the chart of accounts and we make making sure that the, the data that's in the accounting software reflects what you want to see as, as your business. So when you go open a report, it does that information actually speak to you. It is actually relevant to your business. So we, we set up systems like that. It's more towards like accounting systems um, or like how, um, you know, how you're going to compile your receipts, where you're going to save them, where you're going to send them, that kind of stuff. So kind of getting that set up. 
Um, and then, and then we also walk through it, depending on the business, we also can walk through some of the business setup as well. So some people that are just starting out, you know, we make sure that like WCB is, is up and running if, if applicable or, um, other kind of business, business licenses, stuff like business numbers, that kind of stuff, making sure all those kind of systems are in place. I love it. And that's an eight week, an eight week coaching. Yes, it is eight weeks. Um, it includes six one-hour calls. So I kind of split it up because I know everyone can't do every single week. So we do six one-hour calls and then it's unlimited emails and support in between. So people, you know, email me questions um, and I answer them, um, answer them by email or quick phone calls. If it just takes, you know, 10, 15 minutes, we have a call. Um, I also have some activities that I ask people kind of in between calls. So things like, you know, asking themselves questions, that's more also towards the money mindset. So having them Mm -hmm. answer questions about how they feel about money um, and just kind of getting their thoughts around that and just kind of get uh, the wheels spinning a little bit. So what do you, when would you recommend people can do this at any point in their business or is it something to do when you're just, you know, what's the ideal and then what's possible? Yeah. So, um, it is. So it's very customizable. Like the program is not the same for everybody. Um, mm-hmm. The very first call is really just getting to know each other and learning about the business. And then we kind of come up with what the main goals are. So I have people that have come in and kind of already have their bookkeeping. So we're going to focus more on the um, we, we do forecasts and projections doing this as well. If that becomes one of their goals to kind of see um, the mm-hmm. third, the third point on that was understanding your numbers. So kind of finding where to look for them. Um, again, mm-hmm. not like super in detail where it's like, it feels like you're in an accounting course. It's more just like as a business owner, what do you need to see to kind of make business decisions? Right. So that's kind of focus. So I would say for the most part out of like the last few months, more so people are doing it when they're starting out. Um, I find that that's just been something that people are kind of driving to. They don't want to hire a bookkeeper for the kind of the, the first year. They want to see how things go. Mm-hmm. So they do this course. We get their accounting system up to date. They get their bookkeeping 101. Um, we talk about um, where to find certain financials, especially when they're going to make decisions in the next year or two, whether they want an employee or, you know, set up a budget or a forecast to see where things are going in the year. So I would say that's probably the most popular um, mm. is kind of people just starting out or maybe in the first, you know, six, six, 12 months. Um I have had clients that do it that are well established and that is just we customize it a little bit more towards um, the reporting. So we, we look more towards like goals or pricing. I have someone that wants to know more about they're like, I just don't think I'm pricing enough. Like, I don't mm. think that's enough. So we do focus on a little bit more. A couple of the calls are extra just re- related to that kind of stuff. So I think it works for every stage, but definitely the most popular is kind of the startup. And it seems like you're really flexible with like you've got these you've got very um, important arms to your your knowledge right so that you can actually say this isn't a me thing this is someone else or this is what you need right now and I think you know for a lot of us a lot of you listening um, I know a lot of you are in music I know a lot of you are in um, entertainment I know a lot of you are in graphic design and other freelance kind of based careers Um, but I would highly recommend just having a conversation with with Willow Oak and just being like hey let's let's just do a discovery and figure out where I'm at, whether this is a fit, um, and then how to invest in it. Because really, from my own experience, I think I'm bleeding a lot of the money that I could be putting back into my business through inefficiency. Uh, and I think that's a really common a common thing that happens with a lot of people I know because they haven't just they haven't taken that time to set up the structure. Yes, absolutely, and I appreciate the recommendation. That's very thoughtful. Oh, of course. Well, I mean. Being a buddy, butter, buddy, butter, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> we love thems. Um, yeah. Also, don't eat their products. They're not for eating. I <laughs> keep having tempting. to say that. So, my, so tempting. They smell so good. Oh, my gosh. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time, spending it with us today. Um, I really feel like, you know, for personally, I feel like it's demystified a lot of the conversation, a lot of the thoughts that I kind of had and that really constricted feeling when you go to say, I love this thing. Now I'm going to take that next step. And I really hope that in the audience, um, if you're listening in today, that you, you can take a bit of a deeper breath and say, you know what, it's possible. You don't have to know it all. You just have to know who to ask. Um, so thank you for giving us that. I really appreciate it. Of course. And thank you so much for having me. It's been so much fun. And I loved meeting you ladies. Ah, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Bye. I'm sure we'll chat again. We will.
Bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening, Bombshells. In order to continue to elevate, subscribe and don't forget to click that little bell so you can get notified every time we have a new badass brunch. Until next time, stay focused, fierce and fabulous.